down it'll change it'll change the the color of the light as well as it goes through the plasma and that's partial partially uh, redshift the reason for redshift but there's other um mechanisms for objects that uh, are quantized red redshifts But th that's going off topic. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Well, um, I don't know if I should read more. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't have to continue the presentation. Just Well, I think the uh, issue here is, Jerry, that um, people have different interpretations about what the two postulates mean. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And um, then you also have uh, people who have different opinions about which postulate is wrong and which postulate is right. Some people say both postulates are right and it's all correct. Uh, some people like you would say the first postulate is correct, but the second postulate is false. And then there are people like me. I say both are false and be damned with both of them. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, would you say that all objects exist and travel relative to each other, though? You know, th that, and that the velocity of an object is determined through direct reference to another object. Well, here again, okay, this is correct. And, but you have to understand that physics can't make a measurement unless it measures something relative to something else. So all yeah. measurements in physics are measured relative to something else. There's no measurement in physics that isn't measured relative to something else, whether it be temperature or um, force or uh, velocity or whatever. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's also just simple observation and, and reason, you know, that, that, that you can arrive at facts and such. Um, that, well, the, the issue is that what you said is correct. Yeah. Okay. And the point I'm making is that it's correct because physics, all measurements in physics are relative measurements. Yeah. What, what, what you had stated earlier, though, I, I don't see it as part of the first postulate, such as the twin paradox. I don't think it has anything to do with the, well, I mean, just just there being relative uh, 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 observers and uh, frames that, that that that's included, but the the whole time slowing down that isn't part of it at all. I don't, I don't think. Okay, so you interpreting time dilation as time slowing down, correct? Yeah. The, okay. The, 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 that that's from the constancy of the velocity of light. The second postulate is where that is, where that uh, is uh, derived from. Okay, Einstein basically derives what he call what's called the Lorentz transformation, and um, that started out by uh, you. Uh, there's an assumption of a preferred frame or some absolute inertial frame, some starting frame, and then he derives a um, Lorentz transformation into a relatively moving frame. And that so the Lorentz transformation goes from a supposed a rest frame or a stationary frame. He uses the word stationary in his first paper. And then, okay, the, by the principle of relativity, you can derive what's called the inverse Lorentz transformation, which is a transformation that goes from the moving frame back to the stationary frame. And because by the principle of relativity, those two frames are equivalent, the Lorentz transformation is the same for those two different transformations with a change in the variables. So all you do is take the variables and exchange the variables, the, the symbols in the equations. And that's how he derives the inverse Lorentz transformation. He, exchanges the symbols 
Okay. Now, isn't the Lorentz transformation the theory that uh, the, the mathematical uh, uh, deduction that <laughs> you know that that wh whenever that whenever there's anything any, any two objects that exceed the velocity of light linearly, if they linearly exceed the velocity of light. The, uh, the the Lorentz transformation slows them down mathematically somehow to where they're neatly under the velocity of light. Even if there are two objects that travel almost the velocity of light away from each other. So, I mean, you know, the, the way they have particle accelerators, you know, the way they have them going in reverse at almost the velocity of light, and they smash them into each other. See, these particles are going in opposite directions at almost the velocity of light. I mean, the, 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 that, that's like almost double the velocity of light if you combine their relative velocities. Correct. So the, the, the Lorentz transformation would somehow neatly package them in to just uh, uh, underneath the velocity of light, I think. Right. Now, you sort of, you sort of complicated it, what oh, I was sorry. talking about. You uh, particle... talking about something different. In particles, particle, particles in 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 a experiment like like CERN aren't moving in opposite directions. They slam uh, a moving oh, particle really? into a stationary particle. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. I I, I, th I thought that I'd heard otherwise, but. I, I, I... No, the 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 particle that they're that they're moving at close to. The, the velocity of light in in the CERN circle slams into a particle that they have in a target area. Oh, okay. All right. Cool. Okay, so continuing on. What happens is when, if you calculate the length contraction or the time dilation in using the Lorentz transformations, okay, it turns out you get a paradox, okay? And these paradoxes are well known. One of them with respect to time is the twin paradox. Yeah. And there's other ones with respect to length contraction, which is the pole barn paradox, and there's other names and other types. Well, now, um, the, 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 the twin paradox is the same principle as the clock on the plane type experiments. Except it's at a much great, it's, it's extremely high velocity, almost a velocity of light that the, the the person ages exponentially on Earth while they're young in the rocket ship. Though uh, the clock on the plane, of course, the plane goes very slow compared to that. So it's very minuscule differences in, in the discrepancy when they compare the two previously synchronized clocks. Right. So, well, the twin paradox isn't really a good a good example of this, which because of the fact that the, they, they put acceleration in with the twin paradox because one twin has to be accelerated away from the earth. And the claim is that that breaks the symmetry. But the idea is that because of the principle of relativity, the effects of relativity ought to be symmetric because the principle of relativity says that neither one of the two frames can be identified as the absolute frame. And so the both observers measure the same thing in the opposite frame. And what happens is that that leads to a paradox in it, or what would be more properly called a contradiction in mathematics. Yeah. Well, um, you get two different results that don't agree with each other. Yeah, I mean, when there's time dilation, I mean, if if if, if there could possibly be time dilation, you, you you just mentioned about how when there's two relative objects that travel, you know, however fast relative to each other, that uh, they they, they should result in, if there is time dilation. Why isn't all time dilation mutual? Which means that. You know, one would perceive the other clock slowing down, and that one would, click, would let's see the other person's clock slowing down. Of course, you theoretically, I mean, you couldn't see them in the rocket ship zipping by almost the velocity of light, but just that's the way they speak of things in textbooks I've seen. But well, that's a paradox, a contradiction in the mathematical system yeah. that they're using. So that proves that their mathematics is incorrect because in mathematics, when you uh, have a assumptions or a set of assumptions and then you 
you establish a theorem and deductions from your assumptions and you show that your assumptions lead to contradictions, that's considered a disproof oh, yeah. of your yeah. assumptions. But in relativity, it's not considered a disproof of the assumptions. Yeah. Um, well, um, so anyway, my point is, that's why I don't think the relativity postulate is correct. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, again, that, that, that doesn't involve the first postulate, I don't think. I mean, what I know, what I know of the first postulate, it, it doesn't involve time dilation or length contraction or in, anything uh, otherworldly, I would say. Okay. All right. Understood. Well, um, could I read something really quick? Uh, would you mind if I read something really quick? Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Th th this this is how th this is my view of how the uh, time dilation accounts for is meant to account for the the constancy of the velocity of light. Uh, for instance, the, the, the way that uh, the famous equation by Isaac Newton of the distance equals velocity times time. This seems quite accurate and indisputable. However, the constancy of C seems to run counter to this equation. If you alter the distance, it has to affect at least one of the other two terms of the equation. Consider a thought experiment where there's one observer and two light sources. One light source is stationary relative to the observer. The other travels away at, say, half the velocity of light. Allegedly, each of these light waves would clock at the same velocity of 186,282 miles per second. It is understandable that the stationary light source would clock the velocity of light. However, why would the one that travels away at half the velocity of light measure precisely the same? What of all that additional distance, which seems unaccounted for? It is thought that time dilation is what accounts for this extra distance, that time and space would actually transform their abstract qualities to accommodate for the bizarre conditions that the constancy of the velocity of light would inevitably create. That's all. <laughs> Okay, so that's pretty complicated. Um, your objection sort of uh, seems to be that you don't uh, like the idea of time dilation. Yeah, of course. <laughs> what does that What does that mean to you? What do you think that means? Uh, well, I think it's a cool idea. I just don't agree with it. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, um, do you think that time is actually changing? You, you, you don't agree with it at all. So asking I, the I question. I believe in absolute time, which means that the time is the same throughout the whole universe, that there isn't any time relation anywhere whatsoever, gravity or velocity. Okay, well then, um, that would have been something that you probably could have said that, uh, at the beginning of your presentation, you would say, uh, um, yeah, probably know, should, have. <laughs> should have had it in the main points. Well, you should have said, well, you know, this is what Einstein says is his two assumptions. And then he deduces this thing called time dilation. But in my thinking, I don't see how that's possible. I think time has to be absolute. Uh, absolute. And yeah. of course, in general relativity and in cosmology, they assume time's absolute, which strikes me as strange. Yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, you know how muon observations uh, are said to account for the for time dilation. I have a, I have a quick thought about that if you're interested. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. The, um. Here we go. The current mainstream view states that observations of muons in the upper atmosphere provides evidence for time dilation. It is possible that muons decay faster when they travel at such incredibly high velocities since they glide through the air and collide with atoms that permeate the upper atmosphere, whereas the more relatively stationary atoms they are compared with experience more of a static state and last for much more time. 
Also, it is often said that the object that travels at a high velocity is the one for which time goes slower, such as with the, fa with the famous clock on the plane experiments. If a muon is said to disintegrate faster as it travels faster, faster to the upper atmosphere, relative to more stationary muons, that is the opposite effect, which is usually suggested. The plane goes fast while the ground stays stationary. It is the other way around with muons, though. Just a thought. <laughs> yeah, I find it hard to uh, follow that without some kind of a diagram. Yeah, but, that, that, that would definitely be helpful. Um, this are, this business of the muons, I, um, I, I found that it's confusing and, um, as soon as you, uh, you know, I don't recall, um, do you remember there was a discussion about Dr. Zaffi, uh, earlier today? Do you remember? I think, that? I think so. Dr. Zaffi? I, I, I don't quite remember, recall the details, though. Well, um... Dr. Zaffi, um, his name is Carl Zaffi. He wrote a book called The Reminder, and uh, it's uh, got a long title after that, but just call it The Reminder. Mm -hmm. And he brings up this whole issue of the, of the de particle de de decay issue. And it's quite complicated and involved. It's not really very straightforward at all. And... That was when, when I first saw this book, um, it sort of, one of the problems that arises is that the equation that they use isn't the Lorentz transform equation. <laughs> so there's this problem that when they do the muon decay, it use the muon decay equation, it's not the same equation that Einstein derives in his 1905 paper. So you have this equation that they kind of bring out, they pull out of the air to explain muon decay, but it's not actually the time dilation equation of Einstein, okay? And then it gets more complicated when you find out that Einstein changed his time dilation equation from his 1905 paper to his 1907 paper. And he's got a different equation in his 1907 paper than he did in his 1905 paper. Okay, so now we've got three different equations. Which one's the right equation? Okay. Yeah. Well, and the, the way I see it is they just pick whatever equation gives them the answer that they want. Okay. Does, do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the question is, you know, there's no real rigor in it. Where did the rigor come from? I think that's what you're trying to get at in, your, in what you were saying. But this example isn't a very good example to use because, um, the whole issue of the muon decay, it, it, there's a lot of misinformation and the, and the books give, the, they, some people say that the, uh, the time is not contracted, it's the distance that's contracted. So in other words, the muon, the distance between the muon entering the Earth's atmosphere and the surface of the Earth is contracted by by length contraction. And that's mm -hmm. what explains why the muon can reach the surface of the earth when it's not supposed to be able to reach the surface of the earth. Hmm. Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? Somewhat. It's very, huh? Uh, uh, it's, I, can't, it, it's, I can't say completely. Well, I, I mean, the, 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 the idea that, that uh, space compresses or, or however those implied maybe didn't well really the sense. point i'm the point i'm making is that they use whatever they have a it, it's kind of they just pull out of the air whatever yeah whatever mathematics they think is going to make their argument seem valid but it when you start tracking through all the different um you know 
ideas and you know you try to figure out what's really going on what happens is you get mired in all this confusion so it makes sense when you look at a textbook and they give it to you in a textbook and they present it to you as a problem and then they show you what the solution is and you say okay good yeah i believe that the problem is that if you decide you don't believe it and you want to understand what they're talking about and then you try to figure out all the details you wind up in this total morass of confusion and disagreement. Yeah. I've and, heard they don't welcome questions much. Um, yes, because their whole system is really based on, you know, believe, you know, we, this example that we gave you in this book is the correct example. Yeah. And um, don't question it. Okay. Um, the, Part of the issue is that this length contraction idea is kind of is misconceived and it's not really true. OK, and it's pretty easy to demonstrate that it's false. So, you know, the math that is what Einstein did was he used one set of assumptions to derive time dilation, and then he used a different set of assumptions to derive length contraction. So yeah. if you're using two different assumptions, how can you claim the two different phenomenon uh, derived from your theory, but the assumptions that he's using are different for the two different things. And so it's that's just another point of confusion. Yeah. Would you want to hear something that I wrote about length contraction? What, go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> it, well, length contraction is, you know, it's kind of a big bugaboo, but you're right. Yeah. Basically, Einstein, um, I think uh, it comes from the Lorentz Fitzgerald contraction. So Fitzgerald suggested oh, yeah. this as a solution to the Michelson-Morley experiment. Yeah. Okay. And then Einstein just took that as, um, because that was an accepted idea, he just took that and said, oh, my theory proves that length contraction explains yeah. length contraction. But it doesn't make sense when his, in his theory as a whole, because the uh, assumptions that are used to derive length contraction are different from the assumptions used to derive time dilation. And so the there's not a, a consistency there. Yeah. Okay, go ahead with your... Oh, okay. Okay. If length contraction is a valid theory, to precisely what degree does a given object's length shorten? How can an invisible medium push an object and shorten it, and then it returns to its original dimensions while another side of the object is shortened? Why doesn't this effect occur with visible physical objects? If a metal object strikes another object, another dense, though malleable object, and physically alters or shortens a portion of the object, why doesn't it return to its previous dimensions? It is evidence even possible for length contraction, given that if you tried to measure the degree that a given object is shortened, the ruler itself is also shortened. That's all. Yes. Now, here's a, this is an old problem that's been discussed before. So one of the questions that comes out of this is, and I think this was asked very early on, uh, Einstein was asked to explain this. Why is it that when um, the clock um, and time dilation, when the clock goes out and goes and comes back, it loses time. But if I send a rod out into space and bring it back, it's the same length when it comes back. So why is it the clock reads different, but the rod reads the same way yeah. you're in a way addressing that question mm -hmm. are you familiar with what i just said i think so yeah so that's a, another one of those um what's going you know the things about relativity that doesn't make sense mm -hmm. and of course this and, and um this was one i when einstein was questioned about this he gave a very um um obscure answer he basically it was a double talk answer can i add a bit that if if a rod contracts shrinks 
you would expect there be a false compression it and so suddenly this rod shrinks and when it comes to stop again it's back to its original length so somehow there's a force pushing it to make it smaller and another force making it larger again and that no, no, that makes sense well that's what jerry's asking about yeah um, doesn't make sense but so, so you've got inertial uh, frames and you're talking about constant velocity and there shouldn't be any force and suddenly this length contracts and so suddenly you need a force but well, some, some suggest that, that it's the ether that pushes objects to shorten yeah so, uh, so they don't they don't accept the ether either so <laughs> the things hold things is just a total mess it is what they say doesn't really make sense Yes, well, we've heard that before. <laughs> no disagreement on my side. <laughs> Can I read something else? Sure, go ahead, Jerry. <laughs> All right. What would happen if it were possible to reach or exceed the velocity of light? This, often is, this isn't often discussed, even though Einstein himself thought extensively of this through various thought experiments. Actually, Einstein wanted to answer the puzzling question of how would light look if a person could travel with a light beam at the same velocity and observe what it does? How, how would the light look if it were viewed as stationary? Could we even see it at all? If it were possible to try, travel with light and view it as stationary, it couldn't possibly clock at 186,282 miles per second. Actually, objects that travel at any constant velocity stay just as stationary as all other objects that don't accelerate within a given inertial frame, though they might have vastly different surroundings, particularly how objects exist and travel around them. To clarify that real quick, such as like if you strike, a, like you're playing pool, you strike a, a, the cue ball and, and it shoots across the table. Theoretically, you could say, you know, that get, get, given the, the <laughs> first postulate, you could say it's the, the, the pool ball is moving across the table, or you could say that the pool ball is stationary, it travels at a constant velocity, and that the whole table, the room, the house, and the earth moves in the opposite direction while it stays stationary. Of course, it's so outlandishly impractical, no one would ever say that, but it, the, it, theoretically, it seems possible. <laughs> okay. Uh, Do you, exactly find that, do you find that to be a contradiction or an absurdity or what? Well, no, no one would claim that realistically. It, it, it's, I mean, the, 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 the way that you can't tell what's in motion, such as two spaceships in outer space, the way, you, the, the way, you know, if you're in one and someone else is in the other and they're moving towards you, you know, you might be moving towards them or you, mo you might mo both be traveling away really fast and just one of them is slightly going slightly faster. There are just so many different possible configurations, and they're all equally valid. They're all possible. If you believe in the first postulate, which I don't. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what, what, what would you say is mistaken of that, then? Well, like I said, you can't, you, you're just kind of taking a principle and making it unrealistic in terms of a natural physical situation. Yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 pool, the pool ball and table was definitely an outlandish uh, uh, example. Just, right, uh, and your, your conclusion was that the principle of relativity did not apply in the case of the pool table because the... Oh, no, it does. It does. Well, apply. but you said it didn't because the alternate, the other point of view was absurd. Well, I, I didn't say it was absurd. Okay, it, it's outlandish. Like no one would. No oh, one outlandish would is not that. the same as absurd. <laughs> a, 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 absurd means wrong in a way. Like that's mistaken. It, uh, outlandish means it, it's wild and zany, but it could be true. Okay, well, that I, I think absurd means that too. But anyway, <laughs> okay. <laughs> we can quibble about the words, but but the point is, you don't think that's really. A, a physical situation that's not a physical situation that's a real in the real world well we can sort of forget of, of, of the pool table example 
that I mean that, that was that, that's just sort of a thought experiment. As far as objects traveling relative to each other, and, and that they need they need another like an object needs another object as a direct reference to know how fast it goes relative right. to that object. I believe in that though. Well, the point is, if you're making a measurement, you have to have a point of reference, and your point of reference is your measuring device. Well, what type of measuring device? Well, in the case of, um, you know, as Rick was talking about, your measuring device is a laser beam that you're bouncing off the moon. So your, so your stationary frame is attached to the measuring device that's shooting off the laser beam. You can simply observe the objects with your eyes. You can just simply view, view an event. You could see two cars uh, going past. That, that, going in past which case, place. you would be the reference frame. Well, you, 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 could, you could. Well, you, you, it could be one car or the other or yourself. I mean, yeah, but now you're now you're the only if if you're the well, I mean, if you're making many the objects in the universe, they all they all travel and exist relative to each other, all objects. I would say. Well, that's because you're shifting the frame of reference, your reference point. So there are different ways to look at uh the correct. most objects. But in physics, we only talk about how we can make measurements. Yeah. Okay. Well, so you, you could technically me you could technically me you could technically measure all that though. And it would make sense. Presumably, presumably you could. And then in the case of mechanics, it's possible you can get a um, system of equations. This is the key point. If you're doing if, if you're doing the pool table example and you have the pool ball be the reference frame or the table be the reference frame, you can set up uh, equations of mechanics that are consistent. They'll give you the same result whether you choose the pool table as the reference frame or the pool ball as the reference frame. Yeah. But in Einstein's relativity, you do not get consistency. That's how, the problem. How, how, how then? <laughs> the math equations do not work out correctly. Well, maybe the math doesn't if they add something extra to it, but the way that I understand it seems to work in, in my view. Well, the point is that the paradoxes show that it doesn't. It only works if you take one frame of reference as the absolute frame. You can't take more than one frame of reference and get a consistent set of equations. Would you say you could switch them? If there are two objects in outer space, could you take one as the absolute frame and then say, well, hey, I can take the other one as an absolute frame as well? You can do that, but you can't take both at the same time as the absolute. Oh, I agree. I agree. I agree with that for sure. Yes. Well, the problem but is each way is equally valid, though. I would say. Well, it <laughs> assuming that the the theory is correct, yes. The in the case of mechanics, that's true, and you can do that. Okay, but. What you want is a simultaneous set of equations. And the problem is you can't take both frames of reference is absolute in Einstein's theory, okay, and solve a simul simultaneous set of equations and get a correct, consistent answer. It doesn't uh, work. I, 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 th I think, uh, like, as far as, you know, the, 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 the old Earth, the Ptolemaic Earth-based solar system, they thought the Earth was the, uh, the absolute uh, frame, the absolute uh, point of reference. I mean, they might not express it that way, but uh, um, as far as, far as uh, like calling something an absolute frame, that would mean that everything in the universe travels and exists relative to that, whether it's a point in space or whether it's the earth or just any given object. I mean, I don't think well, in cosmology and in, in cosmology, they do assume that to be the case. What, what, what is the point of reference then? What, what is the absolute frame that they consider? Well, you have an absolute frame of time and then you have an absolute frame of space. What is, what is the absolute frame of space? Just 
just just the, it's the, a, the a mathematical space. coordinate system and their mathematical court in the case of general relativity their mathematical coordinate system expands as a function of time don't you have to choose points though points in space and that they're relative to each other well i mean you can't just use I, space I, you, know, you, you don't really you don't really know what they're talking about that's the problem okay they have an absolute time, and presumably there's some kind of absolute space in which all coordinates are expanding in. Okay. But you see, that's all obscure because of the way they couch everything in, in their assumptions. And they've got a lot of assumptions where they couch things in ways that don't you really can't understand what they're talking about when they're talking about coordinate systems. But in order to be to talk about the universe is expanding, that implies that you have a coordinate system that you can measure this expansion of space, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a coordinate system. Yeah. Well um Here's a quick thought. Uh, it's just a real quick paragraph. If a spacecraft were in outer space, far away from anything observable, such as planet or stars, the spacecraft's position or velocity seems impossible to know. At least it could appear that way since there isn't anything around to compare it to. If the spacecraft doesn't accelerate, it could exist as stationary or it could travel at almost the velocity of light at a constant velocity that each scenario is virtually indistinguishable to the other. That, that's, a short, that's sort of an example of, of points of space. Just, just the, the, uh, the spacecraft could serve a, a, as a position, you know, that, that, that we don't know if that position is stationary or traveling at a constant velocity. Space is just a void. I mean, you could choose any frame of reference anywhere in space and it would be valid. Well, okay, here again, uh, what you, what you have is the uh, a confusion of mathematics and physics, okay? And what you were talking about is a mathematical concept. So you're saying, I'm assuming I'm in space someplace. Okay, well, you know, you're, you've confused math, uh, physical space, physical reality with mathematical, um, um, well, doesn't the math apply to reality? I mean, is, is it, shouldn't it be a true reflection of reality? Yes, yeah. you would think so. But in this case, what what is, what you did was you set up a mathematical idealization in place of a physical reality. Okay, and mm -hmm. so if I'm NASA and I'm and I have a Voyager space probe that's exiting the solar system. Okay, they know where that space probe is relative to physical set of coordinates. That's right. So um, I'm not really sure whether you have you can proceed on. I, I think part of what happens in, in, in the example that you were talking about, when you start talking about um, in something, someplace in outer space, um, again, I go back to the point where me uh, to do a measurement, if you're talking about physics, you have, you're doing a measurement. When you do a measurement, you're doing a measurement relative to something based on, on a standard, um, you've, you've set up a standard. So you can't just say, imagine a spaceship in outer space and it's moving or it's not moving um you can't do that you have to <laughs> you have to say what if it's physics you have to say what your frame of reference is that you're measuring in well a frame of reference can be chosen you can choose them arbitrarily i mean I, that's, I a, choose, I that's einstein's years. that's einstein's claim that's his claim. That's his postulate. That's what his is special claim. about a frame of reference that that, that 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 I mean, if you don't choose them, how do you find them? Well, um, basically, the, what they do is they start with the Earth, 
and the uh, as you said originally the Greeks and the ancients uh, said that the earth was stationary and the heavens revolved around the earth, right? Yeah. And so they made the choice that the earth, their point of observation is the, uh, is the reference point. And then when Newton came along and they brought in the uh, um, um, more modern physics, if you will, he asserted, well, actually it was Copernicus, I'm sorry. Copernicus asserted that the sun is the stationary point. Yeah. Okay. And so everybody said, oh, that makes the mathematics simpler. And so therefore that is correct. Not so much because it's physically correct, but because it made the mathematics simpler. Well, I think you have to have the idea of epicycles where plants would, would spin, like, like cir circle around, like, Go ahead, Roger. Yes, sorry. sorry. Copernicus's mathematics was actually more complicated. I, I know that. I know that. But by the time of Newton, they had, you um, had to simplify things. They, 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 they believed that the orbits were circular, and then Kepler came along and said, oh, they're ellipses. And that's what simplified things. Well, I. Time. I was trying to be simple, and yeah. it's actually the Newtonian system that makes it simpler, not the Copernican That's system. The Copernicus it. was the Copernicus. first one to bring that up. Yeah, That's it. Copernicus, uh, Copernicus made it more complicated, and then Newton had to simplify things. Well, that's why there was resistance to what Copernicus said. But Newton made it simple, and they said, oh, the mathematics is easier if we assume the sun is the center of the solar system using Newton's methods. The, the, pe the people who believed the Earth was the center uh, stationary, they had some valid arguments. And it took a long time for there to be. Right. Okay, I'm sorry. But anyway, um, do you understand what I'm saying here, Jerry? Yeah, I think so. And the problem is that um, Einstein said, well, because in mechanics, okay, we can use this principle of relativity, he said, well, we'll just apply that to light. And yeah, but the, the problem is that he got the math wrong. That's basically the simple answer. He got the math wrong. And well, actually, the uh, the principle of relativity doesn't really involve light. If light didn't exist, the principle of relativity would, would stand, I would say, personally. Well, I don't really object to the principle of relativity if it's mechanics. But the problem is when you try to apply it the way he applied it yes. and relativity, you get the wrong answer. So um, if, you, if you make an assumption, your assumption is the principle of relativity. You make an assumption, you develop a mathematical system, and your mathematical system is inconsistent and gives the wrong answers, then there is something wrong with your assumption that you started with. You shouldn't have started with that assumption. The that's, because, that's, that's because the second assumption was the false one. When you tried to combine them, that was when the confusion started, I would say. Well, that's that's one point of view. I, I don't take that point of view. I take that point the point of view that they were both incorrect. All right. <laughs> because if you apply the first principle, you get the mathematic equations wrong. Okay. And then, you know, the second postulate merely allows you to cover up the fact that you you got the wrong equations in the first place it's, I, it I, I i just think they're both incorrect as they stand they could possibly be modified to give you the correct answer um but the way they're taught in the textbooks it's you know it's just you can't get the right answer from what they're what they're using as assumptions. Yeah. It's kind of hard to 
but you know, if you want to go with one's correct and the other one's not correct, that's certainly you're welcome to go with that. I'm not sure you're going to convince many other people that that's the case. I thought I saw a lot of skepticism. Um, I, I'm glad to talk with anyone about it. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I've written I've written much more about it as well. Um, well, this has troubled people for, uh, let's see now, we're coming up on 120 years now. Um, you know, and in 120 years, they haven't solved this issue. Um, his, his theory came out in 1905, and probably the mistake was they shouldn't have published it in any scientific journal. That uh, my understanding is that, that there were... Uh, uh, there were some, I, I guess it was peer reviewed and some people said this wasn't really very good, but um, they apparently published it anyway, despite the fact that uh, people criticized it and uh, didn't like it. It got published and um, yeah, it could have been. Um, Hi. Hello. Uh, the, the thought is that Einstein's paper of wasn't peer reviewed. It was just published as speculation. Well, my understanding is that there are people who, uh, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. My understanding was there were people who objected to it and said that it was incorrect. Yeah. But maybe that's after the fact. Yeah. Well, I don't think that, that they, weren't, they weren't so rigid on peer review back then, I think. And so his friend Max Planck said, yeah, publish it, and that was good enough. Yeah, so I, it, it wasn't very rigorous. My view, and there are some people who have talked about this, that said that Einstein's paper would never have gotten published under under today's peer review standards. Right. That's probably it correct. Looks, it looks like that. But the trouble is, it, it got seemed to be published as speculation. And then mostly it was mostly ignored. No, nobody sort of like paid much attention to correct. it. Correct. It was only until 1919 that Einstein became famous, Edison, Edison said, oh, I confirmed general relativity. Einstein becomes famous, and then they accept the um, special relativity form his 1905 paper without question then. So it's just okay. built on that. Um, but anyway, the point is, it's been 120 years since uh, that 1905 publication. Uh, almost, I guess, in uh, next year be uh, 120 years. <laughs> That's a long time to be arguing about something and not figure out what the right answer is. So well, now, as people have, have 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 had their disagreements, of course. Though, well, they, they weren't. They weren't. Their uh, their views weren't popularized, though. Well, Dingle has talked about this in his book. He says that people mis misunderstood what his theory was about. That's Dingle's thesis, that people thought that Einstein's theory was just Lorentz's theory, you know, with the uh, different mathematical equations. And uh, he never actually uh, presented a complete theory of special relativity, which uh, ought to cause you pause. Um, and uh, there's this book uh, he tried in 1912, I think it was 1912, to do a, a complete comprehensive theory of special relativity, and it, he never completed the manuscript. And um, it's kind of, you know, like, why was there never a fully complete theory of special relativity ever published by Einstein, but now there never was. Yeah. Uh, another, another mystery is how does special relativity morph into general relativity? And it's supposed to be via the equivalence principle. Yeah, well, I think Einstein really basically thought he was on to something hot and by in his two thousand in his nineteen oh seven paper in which he changed the uh, 
uh, which is quite different from the 1905 paper. Um, he gives an introduction to general relativity in that paper. So it looks like he was already moving past special relativity um, and he never really finished special relativity and was already you know, charging off in a different direction. I think that's where a lot of the problem comes from. Uh, another thing, he never really finished general relativity because he then went off to search for what was his unified field theory. And unified field theory is supposed to be combining gravity with uh, e electromagnetism. And so but you look back, special relativity is dealing with electromagnetism and general relativity is dealing with gravity. So suddenly he's got this problem, general relativity and special relativity don't really combine properly with these two things, gravity and electromagnetism, hence his quest for unified field theory. So he, he never finished. Right. He finished. And it's, I, don't, I don't think the mainstream people really appreciate this. They, Correct. And so what happened is that um, people other than Einstein took his, gen, his special relativity theory as they understood it and started publishing books and papers. And they basically came up with what we consider to be special relativity, not Einstein. And of course, by this time, Minkowski had gotten into it and, and, um, and um, said, oh, you know, came up with this uh, four dimensional space time business. And Einstein, as I understand it, originally said he didn't really understand it, didn't like it. But then he said, OK. And, um, you know, that became the, the dogma mathematics of it. And he really didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> kind of ironic. Yeah, part of it is, is it's the, what, what came later after general relativity was Clouseau Klein theories. And, and they basically tried to pick up on the idea of uh, the fourth dimension. Why not add another dimension, make the fifth dimension? And then right. why not add the sixth, the seventh, and eighth? And then they sort of came up with this idea of things like superstring theory. So that's where all the extra dimensions come from. So basically, they've got no unified theory unless uh, something like string superstring theory is correct. So it's all sort of a botch. But they really can't really prove superstring theory because uh, it doesn't seem to predict anything that they can test in the experiments. So it's just, just one process of making a mess. So, Jerry, do you have any more? Oh, uh, well, well, um, well, <laughs> I was just thinking, like, well, I just had the thought of string theory, how uh, just the idea of higher dimensions. Uh, what, what Roger was saying about how, you know, Einstein uh, suggested the fourth dimension of time, which that was Minkowski. Oh, OK. Yes, you're right. Uh, uh, he, Einstein accepted it though, but uh, uh, I, I think string theorists w wanted to sort of uh, you know, follow that same line of thought to add extra dimensions because Einstein or you know, Einstein accepted the fourth as time, which time and, and space don't seem in the same category. Actually, I don't think space has dimensions itself, I think it's physical phenomena that have height, depth, and width. They've extended it to sort of a mystical meaning, I think. And with string theory, I mean, th their, idea, their ideas in string theory that, that have nothing to do with unifying the, the, uh, the, the forces, such as invisible, like, uh, like one-dimensional strings. I don't think one dimensions can exist either. One and two dimensions can't exist on their own. How could height depth exist without depth and width? You know? <laughs> Well, I think what you've, what you've, I think the idea here is, is that um, um, physics is really basically not physics, it's mathematical fantasizing. Uh, I think that's the whole point. Um, how can we come up with a, a, a mathematics, you know, we can, you can, there's no, nothing that tells you what mathematics is a correct mathematics. 
you can make any mathematics you want. You know, you just make a set of assumptions and then and then based on those assumptions, you derive theorems and results. And you can make anything you want out of that, depending upon what assumptions you use oh, in wow. making your mathematics. So then the question is, do those assumptions that we use to make this mathematics apply to the real world? Okay. And that's the that's the issue. And the issue is you can have an infinity of mathematical ideas out there, an infinity of assumptions. How are you going to find the real world correct model of reality when you have an infinite number of mathematical possibilities? Well, I, th I think through reasoning and observation that much, much can be determined to decipher the truth of things. To, well, to I, but they, they like that argument to reduce the number of possibilities down. And then they reduce the possibilities down and they still have more, more models than, uh, than they can match to reality. I would say that if you have an accurate assumption and and, and the, uh, the the mathematics are logically sound, then then you have a correct theory. Uh, if there are mistakes, uh, you know, if there if if there there's you know ad hoc ideas thrown into the math, where you know to to explain anomalies that that we don't understand, you know. It, it's a it, it, yeah. I mean, you can build an elaborate theory, like you're saying, and uh, and it's meaningless a lot of times. Especially, I mean, you can even have a correct assumption and have have the wrong math. But uh, of course, if you have an incorrect uh, assumption, you know, no matter how much math you uh, add to it, it, it's wrong. You know, right. So. It goes back to my point. I think both of his assumptions are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a double whammy. <laughs> yeah. oh, we can make it a triple uh, whammy. Uh, <laughs> we can make it a triple whammy. <laughs> uh, triple whammy is that space and time are not continuous fundamentally. And so all of the use of real numbers math is is basically only at best an approximation suitable for engineers because how do you define continuous though uh you can represent position as a real number so there's an infinite between any two points there is an infinite number of positions with quantization of space there's not an infinite number of positions what, 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 why? Why is there a limited number? I mean, what? 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 What, what determines how, how many steps it takes to get there? You, you know what I mean? A, a whole new assumption: the quantization of space, time, and energy. In this case, does that involve the, the Planck the length? Does that involve the Planck scale? No. Well, how, how, how do you it arrive? At, how, how do you arrive at a unit? How do you arrive at one unit? It's based upon the assumption of continuous space time. And it uses those constants like Planck's constant, the speed of light, and so forth, to, to get those values, which basically mean nothing. <laughs> so that uh, the, the only way uh, or the alternative that I uh, prefer is an entirely different set of assumptions. Like one, like the assumption, for example, that length is quantized. If length is quantized, uh, it, it, it has all kinds of consequences. And all of these paradoxes, and in fact, uh, both special and general relativity are just plain wrong. Uh, again, <laughs> uh, well, not even really worthy of discussion. How 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 many how many points would you say would exist within the span of an inch, for instance? If there's oh, if there's a if there's a limited amount, the, the fundamental length constant in binary mechanics is about point uh, six seven or let's say two thirds of a femtometer, and so just uh, uh, do the conversion of how many points in an inch that you've got. 
So, the, so the, how is that scale arrived at the units that 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 of the points? By reverse engineering of the uh, uh, basic constants, which are unexplained measurements, have the status of unexplained measurements, at least before my work, they had that status. And uh, those, uh, those are your, uh, 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 you can arrive at what the fundamental, when you quantize space time and, um, and uh, energy, uh, you uh, uh, you basically are quantizing the units of measurement in physics of uh, mass in terms of kilogram, uh, expressing energy in terms of kilograms, length in terms of meters, time in terms of seconds. And so with that fundamental assumption, we start from there. And uh, uh, that's how, you know, we can reverse engineer back from, uh, you know, my paper, Binary Mechanics Fact, uh, explain, g gives the chart. And I think I may have even sent you that chart. Oh, I think so. It, it's, it, it's how the secondary constants, you see C, uh, the electric charge, Planck's constant, uh, the gravitational constant, all, all of these are secondary constants. They're not orthogonal. They don't form uh, an orthogonal basis, uh, mathematically speaking. Uh, but uh, energy, length, and time do form a, an orthogonal basis. And this is why all of the quantities measured in physics uh, resolve down to these three values for mass in kilograms, length in meters and time in seconds. That is an orthogonal basis. And, and in other words, um, I, I give the primary constants, I gave you the primary constant for length, uh, uh, about two thirds of a femtometer. And there's similarly for, uh, for energy and time, there are fundamental constants. Those fundamental constants uh, uh, were arrived at by reverse engineering backwards from the secondary constants, which are not orthogonal, which are redundant. They contain redundant information. That's what non-orthogonal is saying. How and is the reverse engineering done exactly? By look <laughs> with great pain. Okay. Mm -hmm. Imagine. By what, by what means? Okay. Uh, the, the universe is our spaceship. Okay, uh, imagine you had an alien spaceship and you, and you go in there and you find there's fiber optic cables. You find uh, certain uh, anti-gravity mechanisms or whatever, whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm making a fantasy story here. And you, you said, well, well, what is this used for? What, what is it good for? Is there some use for this? How come there's not electric wiring in this spaceship? and so forth. Well, the universe is our spaceship, okay? Uh, in other words, we have the advanced technology all around us right now. All we have to do is look at it and reverse engineer it. So what was the reverse engineering done with technical equipment? With, well, you know, I, I've used- with, with scientific instruments. What scientific instruments? Yeah. I, anything you want. Well, how, how is the reverse engineering done? I, I don't really understand. Personally. Well, okay. Well, uh, for our one thing, uh, let's take fractional charge of the electron, okay? Uh, and let we uh, have a value for the rest mass of the electron. And we uh, the quantization work, it, it suggests that the electron contains at least three parts. And so that in other words, the one third of the rest mass of the electron is going to be your basic energy unit, your primary constant for, for energy. So I gave you the simplest one <coughs> in the list. <coughs> I, I, I've heard I've heard that, that they don't know the uh, the exact size of an electron, or that they I've even read that it may not have a size at all. Well, in binary mechanics, you're given the exact size. That's the so, advantage. Uh, how, how does the, the size open the door to a whole new world 
of discovery. How does the size of an electron determine the units to, to measure uh, uh, distances in space and time? Well, okay. When you quantize space, uh, what what the approach that I took, uh, no, in other words, we're going to start with a fundamental uh, assumption, which I call full quantization of energy, space, and time, okay? And basically, everything else is what are the consequences of following that assumption? What you guys have been talking about with relativity and this and that and the other, you're following the consequences of the assumption of continuous space and time. And you see all the mess. And as Harry pointed out, after 120 years, uh, it's still a mess. <clears throat> so uh, I decided to do problem? something different and with full quantization, OK? I think I forgot your question. Uh, could you repeat, Jerry, your question? <laughs> What, what what would you say you disagree with as far as what we were talking about with the, with with the relativity oh, of the just, just about everything uh, in other words we don't need special relativity we don't need general relativity uh, because with the absolute structure of space proposed again following the assumption of full quantization um, there is an absolute frame for example, we can study the proton in absolute zero motion. Okay? How? No, no one else can do that with your assumptions. How can you study the, uh, the proton in, 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 in with zero motion? Well, when it turns out when you cool things down to zero Kelvin, all particle motion stops. However... There are one state quanta motions in what I call the bit cycles, which are one of the major discoveries of, of binary mechanics, okay? Pursuing this uh, assumption of full quantization. <coughs> so the one state qu quanta continue to move in these bit cycles at zero Kelvin, but they do not exit a bit cycle because all particle motion, all motion in the universe, in fact, results from a quanta leaving one bit cycle and entering another. And, and that does not happen at zero Kelvin. So what, what does that tell you as far as the, uh, the quantization of things? Oh, just about everything. Just about everything that uh, uh, the theories you guys have been discussing fails at. I don't know, I don't know how, how the, the units of the quantization is determined though. Well, why, why isn't there a smooth transition? Why, why does it go bit by well, bit? Let's, let, let's start with the, fun, the, the full quantization assumption. With that assumption, it implies there is some value in meters for length, which, which is, you know, a basic uh, uh, quantized length, that there is some basic value for a unit of energy. Planck wanted to define a unit of energy, but he never did. My equation one defines, for the first time that I'm aware of, the quanta of energy. Uh, Planck's constant is energy times seconds, so it's an action, it, it's not energy per se. So Planck did real well, he did wonderful things, but he didn't quite get to his goal to quantize energy. It took my assumption of full quantization to get there. And then lastly, seconds. So uh, once you have that assumption, it implies that there is a value for the length. There is a value for the energy in electron volts or in kilograms, uh, depending upon how you want to state it. Uh, and there is a value for time, a, a quantized time in seconds. Do you follow? Are you with me there so far? I, I, I see what you're saying, though. I have to admit that I'm somewhat skeptical. Uh, why isn't time? Well, that's good. You should should be skeptical because this is an entirely different view of physical reality 
yeah. than uh, all, every other model out there in the world today, okay? Well, space, space, so space all seems to be... All the other models that, that have been discussed in CMPS are based upon continuous space-time. Well, why isn't space simply an empty void where, where, where uh, interactions occur, where physical objects exist? Why, why isn't space an empty void? Well, okay. Uh, with the length constant, we define a fundamental locus, which is a cube of space. It can have something in it or not. In other words, if it has something in it, that a, a single locus, uh, then, then it's in, we call it in the one state. If there's nothing in it, we call it in the zero state. So now we've defined things in space. Okay. Uh, another, in other words, you know, we're we're not saying we don't know what the things are. We're just saying there is something there or there isn't, and that we call a quanta. If if it's uh, or a one state, mathematically speaking, it's called a binary digit, zero or one. And, you know, all, you know, there are dozens of publications on my website about uh, deriving the various constants. So all of your question of, 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 of how this reverse engineering took place, look at the derivations for the constants that are there. And that's how the reverse, uh, and, and I have a chart called, uh, let's see, it's, it's uh, I think it's figure one in the paper, binary mechanics, FAQ, F-A-Q, you know, frequently asked questions. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you want to see the derivations, they're listed there. And you can get out your Excel Pro program and see that all the math is, co is correct. Okay. Well, okay. Um, I guess we're getting to the end here. I want to add. So from your point of view, Jim, there, there is absolute space and time. Correct. That's what I thought. Okay. Because your fundamental units that you're talking about, you're, um, they can't shrink or change. They're fundamental. Exactly. So uh, there's no time it. dilation. There's no length dilation. Look at it from the point of view of uh, the uh, first starting assumption of fundamental uh, of full quantization. Einstein and all and some of these other people that we're, we're, we're talking about, the so Lorentz making his transformation equations and so forth, had no concept of 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 uh, that. In fact, the fundamental units of measurement in physics are quantized. Jim. Physics you know, we're, 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 we're not talking about theoretically, we're, we're talking about the actual underlying physical reality is quantized. He, these people had no idea of that. Also, they had no, uh, uh, Einstein had no idea of what the content of vacuum is. That's one thing that it, it has been revealed by uh, the studies in bi binary mechanics. And so really, Einstein didn't even have a chance. I mean, he didn't have a chance in hell to even get close to some realistic physical theory without the knowledge of full quantization and uh, uh, and particularly vacuum composition. Would you say that, that time exists with, with uh, in, 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 in tiny increments, such as a movie camera show, like the, the pictures of a movie camera? Exactly, yes. And so we have we can look at processes like the the change of state of cesium 133 which is a a, a, a a widely used atomic clock we can look at that frame by frame as to what is going on there okay so yes so exact exactly right in other words time takes the role much as the central clock in a in a computer uh, takes oh okay it clocks how fast things are occurring frame by frame because the system state is defined by <coughs> which loci <coughs> in a cubic lattice 
are in a one state. That's your system state. It's real simple. Okay. All the questions is, is, is what is matter? And, you know, uh, binary mechanics does not address that question. You can, you can say a one state is a little banana. You can say it's a little uh, Tesla automobile. You can say it's what, a little man or woman. You can say it's whatever you want. But in binary mechanics, we just call it a one state or a quanta. It's in a uh, L-sized cube. Uh, is either one state or zero state, and, and there are no other possibilities. There can't be two quanta within a cube. There can't be minus number of quantas. There's only none there or one. When and, you say you accept the, the idea of uh, photons. Well, photons are a are, are, are construct of really thousands of uh, pro probably or maybe even millions of qu quanta. For me, a photon is an event in a photon detector, such as an L, the uh, you know your your camera mechanism, you know that that uh, or in the eye, you know the molecules that change uh, <coughs> conformation when a quote photon enters. <coughs> Would you say that 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 a light wave is con consists of photons? That a wave consists of photons or that they're different well yeah. there are no waves i think he's saying that we're out of time yeah well, we're, we're running out we better end it now 27 okay. seconds 24. Good. thank you all right see you tomorrow okay. thank you continue Carry on on. Tomorrow, then. Bye -bye. Okay. thank you god bless you. stay healthy stay happy cheers thank you for uh J jerry for all of your representation. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for thanking me. <laughs>